This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Today on the show, I have Jean-Philippe Bouchot. His second appearance, great first appearance over the summer of 2014. Today, he comes on to talk about his new paper, written with several of his colleagues, Tail Risk Premia versus Pure Alpha. There are two versions of this paper, a short version and a long version. The links for both will be in the write-up for this podcast episode if you want to read. Now, before I jump into my interview, one quick comment. Sandy Brasher forwarded me a Barron's article that looks like a data January 23rd. Can managed futures hedge funds revive? Question mark. Written by one Lawrence C. Strauss. The opening sentence, managed futures hedge funds caught fire in the second half of 2014, ending a multi-year funk in which many investors had left the strategy for dead. End quote. Now, of course, remember, managed futures can mean any type of strategy. The primary form of managed futures winners in 2014 were trend-following traders. I said, damn it, I know there's a lot of people, even in the industry, and they love the phrase managed futures, but man, it confuses issues sometimes. Trend-following did fantastically well in 2014. And this is Barron's grudgingly acknowledging that trend-following did well. Why do they not just come out and offer a olive branch or a a word of uh, confirmation or word of congratulations for a strategy that did so exceptionally well in an environment where trends came out of nowhere unexpectedly. The fundamentalists were not saying oil was going to be on the 50% decline. They were not predicting dollar moves. Trend following was the strategy that caught those moves, did exceptionally well. But hey, look, Barron's puts a lot of fundamental information out. I mean, I've, we've all looked at a Barron's before. There's a lot of data in there, a lot, all kinds of stories and stuff. I would not expect Barron's to come out and give a banner salute to trend following, even after it's done well. That's just against their book, so to speak. The article continues, quote, The problem with trend following is that it is good until the trend changes. Finding these trends is not that hard, but it's hard to determine when the trend is going to end, end quote. That is Richard Bernstein, who heads Richard Bernstein Advisors, a New York money manager that pays a lot of attention to macro themes, whatever that means. But it's hard to determine when the trend is going to end. Does he actually think that is the sole basis for profit? That's the sole basis for technique? Simply an exit strategy? You just randomly target some trend and and the tricky part is knowing deep in your gut when the exit will happen? That's the hard part? I don't know what this guy does for a living, but he doesn't apparently know what trend following is. The article finishes. Still, investors should be cautious. Trends can break down or even reverse in a flash, as evidenced by the recent currency upheaval brought on by Switzerland's central bank, end quote. That's the end of the article. Once again, written by Lawrence Strauss of Barron's. I just noted this on a most recent podcast of mine, letting one of the most successful trend-following traders who was talking on CNBC acknowledge how much he lost on the Swiss franc move. I believe it was one-tenth of one percent. But here Barron's ends with, ooh, this dastardly trend following. You don't want to think about it because think about that Swiss franc move. And essentially what he's really trying to do is compare trend following traders to the foreign exchange brokers that went belly up. So there's always an agenda. There's always an angle. People are always looking for something to defend their point of view. Sometimes they do it honestly. Sometimes they do it dishonestly. That's the way the world works. I just enjoy pointing out the silliness. My guest today, Jean-Philippe Bouchot, brings great wisdom. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Hey, Jean-Philippe, how are you? Happy New Year. 
Yeah, same here. Very good. And yourself? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I, I hear uh, rumor has it that uh, your firm did did well for 2014. You mean Bloomberg uh, rumor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We're very happy with uh, with 2014, both for our, our flagship f- uh, fund and and also for the the newcomer, which is which is a simpler type of, of strategy that we try to put together for uh, investors who are, you know, more interested in transparencies and lower fees and things that make sense, as opposed to something they see as, as a black box, which I don't think it's necessarily more of a black box than the human brain, but we have a lot of that, as, as you probably know. Well, you know, I was surprised because in all of my readings in the last couple of years, I I've read these reports that talk about systematic quant trend style trading all being dead and obituaries everywhere. And I've gone out to the graveyard and I've seen the tombstones. It's all over. I, I'm, I'm quite curious to how performance actually reappeared. I, I, I really don't think it, it has ever disappeared. Uh, you know, performance is something that uh, goes, uh, comes and goes. And it's, uh, it's really written in the, Shot ratio of, of what you expect these, these strategies to yield over a long time scale. And I think that unfortunately a lot of people just forget about that. Although, you know, it's something that well, is well known that's pretty easy to explain that a strategy with a sharp of one will have negative years often and, and, and sometimes drawdowns of two years. That's, that's absolutely normal. And still, uh, there's this over-interpretation of noise that leads people to do what they shouldn't do. But I guess, you know, in a sense, it's also what trend following is exploiting. Is their exploit, uh, it, It's exploiting the tendency of human brain to extrapolate what, it's, what he's seen in a very recent past. You know, I caught another paper. It wasn't related to trend following. It was a physics post or paper you were talking about being quoted in there the idea of exploiting or exploring to stay put or to seek greener pastures and as i was going through the paper that we're going to break apart today your new paper i was thinking that there was kind of a combination of that that you were staying put but exploring am i am i partially right in looking at that way absolutely absolutely i mean i think a very deep truth and a path to success is to you know, wait and be patient and, and at the same time, uh, diversify and, and try new paths and, and slowly incorporate these new paths in what you already have. Uh, because of course what, what is built is valuable and you shouldn't throw it away as soon as, as wind starts blowing. Let me read the opening sentence and we're gonna, I've got the, the basic paper in front of me and people can download and we'll give a link out uh, in the write-up but people can download the short version and the long version i'm assuming but the basic idea entitled tail risk premium versus pure alpha but the opening kind of sentence risk premium correlates with tail risk skewness but very little with volatility and there's some exceptions to that i think what's really interesting about the volatility part is i'm probably guilty and many people in the quant world the systems world the trend line world talking about volatility as the precursor to profit. And you're kind of pointing out that that's not exactly what you've found out or what you've put in your paper. Well, yeah, true. It's it's actually not at all what we find, except in, in some rare cases. But what we, said, we tend to find is, is actually rather the opposite, that more volatile... For example, when you do a regression of the sharp ratio of uh, many indices across the world for a very long period, what you find is that the higher the volatility, the the lower the sharp ratio. So in that sense, it seems that volatility is not a good indicator of uh, of good strategies. But on the other hand, if you take another measure of risk, which we argue and and I think intuitively it makes a lot of sense, is, is a better determinant of risk, which is a tail risk, negative tail risk, or skewness, then, then, then this risk premium correlation appears very clearly, that, uh, that strategies that have more skewness, that have more tendencies to big drawdowns, have on average better performance. So, so you must be prepared to lose a lot, but if you're prepared to lose a lot, 
then on the long run, the strategies, uh, on these risk premium strategies will make more money. So that, that's at the same time, it's very intuitive, but quite different from the, the usual law that uh, it's volatility determining risk. For us, it's really not a good measure of what's going on. And it seems like as reading the paper, putting myself in your shoes, is the challenge to say for your particular types of strategies that, hey, maybe you're putting a burden on us that's not, I'm going to use the word fair, but you know, all's fair in love and war, but just to view your strategies, the things that I've written about in terms of volatility alone, in terms of volatility as a measure of risk, has been misguided. Yeah, I would say that. And I would also say that what's very interesting in this concept of skewness is that it allows you or us at least, because we've always felt very uncomfortable with this idea of risk premium, which we didn't really know how to interpret precisely. A lot of people, you know, as soon as there's excess return, and, and in a sense, breakdown of market efficiency, they tell you, oh, well, that's because there's a, a hidden source of risk that you're taking. And, and, and actually, they even go further saying that you don't know what this risk is. And at one day or another, this risk will explode in your face and, and, and you lose a lot. And so, you know, it's, it, maybe it's, it's an idea that pervades uh, a lot of uh, academic finance in particular, but but it leave, left us with a, a taste of dissatisfaction in the sense that, you know, it's, it's, it's a vague idea. So what we really wanted to do is to clarify that point. And what we found is that, indeed, it's true that a lot of these strategies that have excess returns, starting from the standard equity risk premiums, starting just from holding stocks, is, is a matter of skewness. But... What we also found is that there are strategies that are definitely different from that, and in particular trend following, and, and that's, that's very interesting. That trend following is, seems to be on that map, a strategy that has both positive sharp and positive skewness. Uh, so in that case, accelerations are rather on the upside than on the, on the downside. So I, I think this is in itself something surprising, something that we didn't necessarily expect to see such a distinct or clear distinction between types of strategies. And the other thing that we find interesting is that when you understand that, then the, the aim is really to try to come up with strategies or mix of strategies that, that reduce as much as possible the skewness while keeping an acceptable level of uh, sharp ratio. And you're talking negative skewness because the positive skewness you'll take. Negative skewness. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes, of course. Yeah, I yeah. mean, the dream would be, well, okay. <laughs> then, then if you want to do trend following, that's good. But, 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 but there's a lot of money to be made on negative skewness too. It's just something that you should know about precisely. You know, you refer to trend following, and I'm, I'm sure some people out there might say, well, Jean-Philippe is, is, is talking his strategy. But, I, I, you know, I think when people see the paper, they'll see this it's fairly uh, this is academic rigor. But you describe trend following as a, as a genuine market anomaly. Why don't you explain your, your thinking there in that descriptor? Because, again, I think that the idea, the, the basic idea that we've been discussing up to now, that, that risk must be somehow compensated by excess returns, Makes sense from a, you know, intuitive or, you know, standard economics point, point of view. And I, I think that it's fair to say that if there's a lot of negative tail risk, then, you know, bearing that risk must earn you something. And there's nothing specially shocking or anomalous in, in having good performance while you send the risk premium. Sell risk premiums. If you hold the risk, if you're an insurer, then, then that's okay from a kind of general equilibrium economic type of reasoning. On the other hand, trend following, which has both this positive skewness or the absence of negative tail risk and positive gains is, is much more striking and, and baffling in a way. So, so this has to come from something else than, you know, this economic argument that you, you're, uh, compensated for holding risk. And I think in this case, it's a kind of, at least we interpret it that way, that the strategies that, that are able to have both positive skewness and positive gains must come from something else. And, and they come from, in our view, behavioral biases that are in the sense of market equilibrium or in the sense of efficient market theory, true anomalies that you can't just 
you know, do away with by invoking excess risk. Maybe at this point, we'll take a nice, just take a big example from the last year. The behavioral biases that were clearly in play uh, as oil has gone down 50% plus. Why don't you take that as an example and just kind of walk people through the thinking of perhaps, because as you talk about it, a genuine market anomaly, you say of behavioral origins. I'm just wondering maybe without just just taking apart oil a little bit from your perspective. Yeah, no, I agree with you that that taking examples is 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 sometimes a good idea. On the other hand, you're always confronted with arguments from people who still want to save uh, the idea of uh, you know rational pricing and fundamental prices and and so on. And in the case of oil, okay, well, suddenly there's a trend effect that I believe in. But then you would have a lot of people arguing on this specific example that oil has been down for a series of, of reasons that I don't want to go into, but that everybody knows about. And, and, and so it's very difficult on a single event to make a case. And what we're trying to do in our paper is, is really look at these strategies over long time scales and extract statistical features that are uh, far beyond a specific example. So, so, you know, I'm always uneasy with examples because because a lot of, of actually the, the diseases of finance is based on the fact that people believe that examples are telling you more than, than what they are. I should have couched that in terms of assuming a diversified portfolio and assuming a longer time horizon. I just think that when I look at something like the oil example, it, you know, if you wasn't something at the it wasn't a big talking conversation of of people talking about this massive drop. So I just thought it was interesting from that perspective. But yes, of course, uh, in isolation, it, it tells us nothing. And you are definitely not trading one market in isolation for the strategy. Sure. And, and actually, a diversified long-term trend following last year you know, made, made a lot of money. For example, our new tra- long-term trend following fund uh, has made like 33 percent or something. That, that's that's clearly last year is a year of diversified trends. That's that's for sure. There's no doubt about that. What has been your feedback from peers, readers, other people about your new paper? What's been the feedback that you've received? Oh, very very good. We are actually surprised to see that you know the paper has been out for a few months uh, only. And we already have people uh, from all around the world asking us, you know, about details of how we compute the skewness and what we think about the results they have on their own uh, strategies. Or, you know, a lot of uh, asset allocators want to have a better view of the funds and the portfolios into which they are allocating. And so they find this idea of classifying the portfolios according to the skewness of the performance is, is, is a good idea that, you know, it allows you in a way to kind of uncover uh, the source of alpha is, or the source of excess return. Are you just exploiting in a way that's maybe hidden uh, these uh, risk premia and these skewed, skewed strategies, or are you doing something different, exploiting different types of uh, market anomalies and having a, a, a skewness that's not so big compared to your sharp ratio? And I, so I think this I hope, at least, that the feedback we have already suggests that it is this, this way of mapping the space of strategies and, and um, in a way, deciphering what's inside a strategy through its skewness characteristic will be a kind of standard glass that the profession will use to, to assess the quality of a strategy. At least that's my hope. It seems intuitive. I mean, you know, you've, I've seen I've seen this from your peers years back. I saw some heavy criticism of, of using only the sharp ratio to judge a trend following strategy. So there's been this this desire to get away from using just volatility as a risk measure. And so I think it's interesting and it's it's intuitive because we've all known that where where does a trend following strategy get its its gains from? We know it's the edges, we know it's the skew, we know it's over to the right hand side, but no one has really attempted to put this into academic rigor, have they? We're always standing on the shoulders of giants. So here, this idea of skewness is a better measure or better determinant of risk premium is in the literature, and there's actually a, a few very interesting early papers on this idea that equity risk premium is more a question of, of 
catastrophic risk or tail risk uh, than a matter of volatility. But these papers remain pretty theoretical and, and focused on the equity risk premium. And so what we've tried to do in, in our paper is to be much more systematic, try to really investigate systematically everything that people call risk premium and, and try to find a kind of uh, regularity or relation between sharp ratios and, and, and skewness. And I think that's where we're innov- innovative in a way, that, that we have been trying to take this vague idea that's been in the literature for a while and, and make it uh, a workable assumption. And in particular, this very well-known uh, risk factors of Sama French, what we find is that some of them can be indeed qualified as, as risk factors, but others, you know, again, have uh, the wrong skewness if they want to be interpreted as, as risk factors. So that's, again, I think it's something that, that will be useful for asset allocators. Given the perspective of this paper, did you find other strategies beyond trend following that you know, exhibited what you call the genuine market anomaly? High minus low factor of Sama French, which uh, say that high book-to-price ratios will overperform low book-to-price, is something that when you speak about that, actually, you immediately feel that there's a problem of qualifying that as a risk premium because in a way you're investing in safe stock. So why should that be a risk premium? And if we go through the exercise of examining the skewness of that strategy, or even more in detail on the relative skewness of the different deciles of the book-to-price uh, indicator, what you find is, is very clearly an inverted relation. You really clearly see that high min- minus low is not a risk premium in the, in the standard sense. In terms of markets, instruments, stocks, bonds, currencies, options, Commodities as well? Sure. In terms of this research, you've just found it applicable across all types of markets and instruments. Yes, yes, yes. That, that's, 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 I think, what's interesting in the paper is that we covered fixed income, we covered the uh, implied vol, obviously, and this, you know, this just intuitively but clearly is the best example of a risk premium. And, and uh, sure enough, it lies as an extreme in our, uh, in our classification. It has Certainly the best shop and the, and the strongest uh, negative skewness. So this fits perfectly the picture. So we've gone through credit, we've gone through VIX, the uh, carry trade on, on, on foreign exchange, etc. Let me ask a philosophical question. You're being very transparent. You're putting a lot of work and effort out there in the public sphere. Some people might say, hey, what, are these insights really so valuable if, if Jean-Philippe is putting, in the, putting them out there in the public sphere? You know, aren't are these worthy of being proprietary secrets? What's your philosophy about transparency and secrets? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. And we've been you know, running this company for uh, 20 years now, and we've always taken the view that publishing papers and, and sharing some insights with the world was, was beneficial for us as well as, I guess, the community, without impeding or, or endangering our business. There are various points that may be too long to address in detail, but one clear point is that we don't publish what's really, you know, a secret of fabrication or detailed strategies. On the other hand, there are things that you can talk about pretty freely without giving any uh, secret away. For example, this classification in terms of, of risk premia is, is, first of all, in the trend that we want to initiate even stronger now that we have these uh, institutional funds that we want to launch. And, and we want to be as transparent as possible on these uh, funds and want our investors to be able to judge the quality of what we're doing. So, you know, this risk paper is, is, is a good example of that. We're, actually trying to educate as much as we can and very modestly our investors, but we also want to give them the means of judging us. You know, what are we providing and that maybe others uh, don't. So that's one point. The second point that we've found for ages now is that by publishing interesting quality scientific papers, it brings a lot of interest in our firm, in particular from young people, and we've been able to hire a stream of uh, incredibly uh, good people 
I think, attracted to the firm because of the quality of our research. So you see, it's a, I think it's a very delicate question. We've taken very early on the, 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 the path of uh, transparency to some extent. Well, we know very well that many of our competitors just take the opposite uh, point of view, that they should be as secretive as possible. You know, I think it's a question of philosophy, and uh, I'm not claiming that what we do is necessarily optimal, and maybe we've given ideas to our competitors that we shouldn't have. But on on the 20-year horizon, I definitely think that we've been right to do that. And looking on a longer time scale, I hope that we'll be recognized as, as having brought something to the academic research and to finance as, as a scientific field, and that, that, that's a satisfying result anyway. We talked about this briefly in our last conversation, and for those people that have not heard, and obviously the, a fairly extensive physics background, and many people at your firm do, talk about the idea of how people, the types of people that you want to work with, the people that come into your shop, the the culture that you have. You're, is This is not a culture of MBAs, is it? No, no, absolutely not. We, we are actually not hiring anybody with uh, any experience in finance. We have been very systematically, except for a very few exceptions over the last 20 years, recruiting mostly people straight out from PhD programs or even a few years of postdocs who have a very strong scientific background, science being, in this case, math or physics or, or chemistry or, or biology or computer science. And the idea for us is to have people who know uh, how to look at the data and to have intellectual rigor and no prejudice. So that that's what our philosophy from day one was, and that's why publishing research has been so important, because I think that that's the target that we had in terms of recruitment. And uh, clearly, people you know, doing extremely difficult things during their PhDs and having high intellectual ambitions are going to be sensitive to the idea that, that they can have fun and they can research on very interesting topics uh, when they come to CSM. Yeah, you talked about prejudices, and I did just one last comment. It, you mentioned it, sometimes in the business and finance side of things, they're not really sure whether, is it them or is it luck? Yeah, I agree. That's, <laughs> I think, one of the biggest questions. <laughs> we hope it's not luck at CSM. Yeah, but, you know, yeah. who knows? Hey, listen, we'll have to we'll have to put the uh, papers in the write up. I, I assume it's going to be fine to distribute and let people get a copy. Sure, absolutely. Okay, yeah, okay. absolutely. Well, okay, I think I've got I've got the short version. I don't have the long version, but we'll make sure we we link to both of them so people can read up. This is obviously not something that you can, we can only gloss over some of the big picture ideas here. People need to sit down and go and, ahead. As you say, there's a short version of the paper, which is essentially contains uh, what I we, we just talked about. But if people want to go into all the details of the longer version that's accessible on the archive. So if you have the link, that's fine. Otherwise, I can send it to you. That'd be great. That'd be great. Thank you for coming on again. We can, I hopefully we can keep catching up in the years to come. Well, I hope we have an interesting paper to uh, give you uh, another shot. I'm sure you guys are going to dream something up in the lab, so to speak. Well, thank you for talking to me and, and talk to you soon. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend-following steps to take, along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.